something good can come of our hopes that something good would come of her getting Emmy on her death certificate. That no one else has to go through this. And it's too late as I'm saying that because people are going through it right now. But it remains unclear when the government will publish its action plan to address that very issue. Well, joining me now is The Times reporter, Sean O'Neill, whose daughter Maeve died in 2021, aged just 27, after suffering with severe ME. Thank you for coming in. When you see how Merrin and her family were treated, does that ring any bells with you? It's incredibly familiar. Um, our family went through something very, very similar and difficult hospital admissions, uh, neglect, stigmatisation, disbelief, uh, resulting in, in death. Um, and Maeve was a, a vibrant, intelligent young woman whose life was just slowly taken away a bit by bit by this awful disease that medicine doesn't really recognise or understand. When you say disbelief, what, what would they say? Well, I'll give you an example. Right at the end of her life, um, we had to fight for palliative care for Maeve because there were people involved in the kind of bureaucracy that grew up around her that... The, the people who didn't believe that ME was a real illness, that they thought it was a fabricated illness or a mental health problem. Um, that persists. Uh, since I started writing about ME and writing about me, the number of people who have contacted me to say exactly the same thing happens to them. Uh, they, they get referred to social services, they're in safeguarding investigations, uh, th people are threatened with having their children taken away from them. I mean, when you say fight for palliative care, are you saying they didn't believe she was in pain? They or? didn't believe she was... She had a physical illness. They believed it was a mental health problem. Now, when Sajid Javid was the health secretary, he announced this change in attitudes. He said, you know, the medical system had failed ME sufferers, but he revealed that this was partly because he had a relative who had ME. He had, in the phrase, lived experience of it. He had a member of his family who, yeah. who had it. But, of course, he then went. Yeah. And... Well, the momentum was lost with him, but there is a team of people who have come up with an interim delivery plan some months ago. So we're waiting for that to become a, an actual delivery plan. We're but always waiting. I think, to be honest, the, the bigger problem is, is not what's going to be written down on pieces of paper or government policies, because we have a nice guideline that was reformed that is still not being implemented not properly being across the country. The biggest problem, as Merrin's mum suggested there, is the attitudes and the culture within the NHS. There is, there is a, a disbelief, a, a culture that says way. ME doesn't exist, it's all in the mind, it's a psychological problem, not a physical illness. Even though there's a growing body of evidence that this is post-viral illness, that, it, that somehow viruses, severe viruses, be it COVID or glandular fever or Epstein-Barr or other viruses, affect people's bodies differently. Some people just don't recover in the way that most of us do. And I think that figure of 250,000, that's been around for 10 years. The, these figures are way out of date. Yeah. We, we're, we're lacking research, we're lacking momentum, we're lacking initiative. And, and we really have a massive cultural problem uh, within it's the medical deliberate. profession, a hostility towards it, I mean. And it's been a tremendous lost opportunity in a way, hasn't it? Because you've got all these hundreds of thousands of people with long COVID, yeah. which is similar, apparently, in terms of the way sufferers experience yeah. um, that, that condition and uh, no research. There, there is research, mm. but it's, it's minimal. Compared to other conditions, it's very, very small, the research that's put into ME. Oh. And <clears throat> there really could be an awful lot more. There is a huge body of people, especially since COVID, and we, we heard a lot of talk of research into long COVID, uh, you know, after the pandemic. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be continuing. Uh, I think that, that funding has dried up, so that initiative has dried up. And so what, what I mean, if the problem is attitudes, what, what do you want to try and change that? I mean, do you think it's something that can be changed quickly? No. Because attitudes traditionally take a long time. It, it's going to take time, but there is movement. So uh, there's going to be a, a, an inquest in July into my daughter's death. And we're seeing from the hospital where she was treated, where We'll find out more about how she was treated at, at the inquest. But we've had a statement from the medical director of that hospital saying that um, there is no inpatient provision anywhere in the NHS for people with severe mm -hmm. or very severe ME. And he adds in that statement that 
this must be tackled at the very highest level. And I think that's a very constructive attitude from a, a hospital that could be taking a defensive stance. So I think we're starting to see and starting... We're dealing with an NHS that funded homeopathy. Until we reverse things back. Now, I'm sorry, I'm offending people here because I know that King Charles had... It was in the Black Spider memos that he had interfered and helped to try and introduce homeopathy on the NHS. Now, homeopathy's been well known to be debunked and just absolute pseudo. I mean, it's garbage. There's nothing, there's no scientific basis whatsoever. Um, and yet the NHS was funding this. So I think this problem's been going on for a long time. That pseudo babble and pseudo babblers, like if you mention Simon Wesley and the psychiatrist at the Royal College, you'll get these people who come and play Darvo and say that all these, all these people with ME that are bedridden and that can't move are a danger to these people. And they come up with these stories to do. I mean, I just could not believe it when I got diagnosed that this was that, that this is what I was diagnosed with. I couldn't believe that people had been were getting treated like this. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I had experience with my, uh, the psychiatric community via my stepfather in Oak Ridge facility in Canada and their abuse, mass abuse, psychiatric abuse, uh, of women who were going through the menopause and the young delinquents in Canada and Toronto and mixing them in with serious psychopathic criminal, you know, criminal psychopaths, the criminally insane, like my stepfather. Um, and those patients and those people have just, you know, recently been awarded a lot of money in compensation. Some of them died before that could come to fruition. I'm one of the people that could, you know, claim compensation because, you know, as my stepfather even told myself, I mean, I've got these messages, it's just unbelievable. You should sue the hospital that released me to you and your mother's care. <laughs> because of the devastation he brought into my life, you know. Um, and it's all, it was all based on pseudo babble, the, the hypothesis of a, a man who was a psychopath himself and who had been given the title doctor. <laughs> you know, a Hannibal Lecter, if you like. Um, you know, they, they, they enjoy um, gaslighting people and seeing people who are ill and powerless try and fight to make them fight, you know, to make them sit up. I mean, it that's what I've observed in this um, in this whole this whole thing that I've been having to study for a while, and you're having to study with the the symptoms that you you so you've got brain fog, you've got all these different things, and things that you're affected by <coughs> as well as just being a woman, you know, that's just maturing, um, and your hormone levels, which are directly related to ME hormones, affect ME. So, you know, people you know, people like me, we've ended up getting into areas of research about, you know, the circadian rhythm, for example, you know, just to just to try and settle our nervous system into a better place. But we're finding that modern life doesn't give our, our nervous systems a chance to um, rest through noise and light stimulation. So... When I was a wee lass, we didn't have a 24-hour society, we didn't have 24-hour TV, none of the shops were open 24-7. We didn't have this constant role of activity. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, there's industrial noise everywhere. There's aeroplane noise in a lot of places where it never used to be. We've created flight paths where there never used to be. And, you know, people with ME notice these things. We're the canaries in the coal mine. We'll, we'll, we'll say first, oh, things are getting a bit noisy or a bit polluted because, you know, it affects us first. Um, and it's just one of the areas that, you know, you do realise that whatever's going on, there's an industrialisation going on again. <clears throat> I've seen it in Dubai, I remember saying, you know, this is like Glasgow in the 70s. And they were just rolled back. 
And Billy Connolly said, you know, he went to LA and came back in Glasgow, looked so clean and so, you know, non-polluted. But it wasn't that we were non-polluted. <laughs> it's just that LA's a pure toxic dump hole, you know, for um, I mean, the traffic. And it's the same with Dubai, the air quality. So um, I think, you know, when we talk about different things in the environment and the cause of ME, they've still not got a, a blood test for MS, but people who have got MS do not get this kind of treatment. So it seems to me that there's a lot of people profiting, both financially and in a, a sort of reputation way, that they're protecting their reputations through lies, and they know it. It's just like the cash report. And the people that have been doing this to, to young, vulnerable people and children, um, and, and with them ending up medicalised for life. So it's a commodification of healthcare. Instead of looking for a, a cure for ME, it's better that we've not got a cure. Obviously, that is what we're seeing here, being played out in real time. So it's just to try and uh, share that so that people can try and understand it. The media have never actually acknowledged the the evidence and they're always denigrating the victims along with this psychiatric community. Uh, and medical doctors are basically, a lot of them are ignorant and they've been told a lot of lies for the psychiatrists who a lot of them are quite certifiable themselves, but we'll not go into that at the minute.